The question today is why was the Wehrmacht considered so combat effective and is still considered so combat effective by many historians? This is a question that was brought up by one of my patrons. And this makes complete sense because the Wehrmacht to a large part was on a tactical and operational level very effective. Now, what is the reason for this? Now, well, first off, there's tactics, operations and strategy. So tactics, smaller time and space and smaller force level. And then it goes up and up and up. So basically you could say tactics is about skirmishes, operations is about battles, and strategy is about campaigns, whereas grand strategy is about wars, to keep it rather simple. I will go into detail in another video on this. Now, what is the reason for this? One aspect is that the Wehrmacht trained extensively pre-war. And for a long time, the Kriegsakademie, the war academy in Germany, was one of the only ones that provided a free year-long complete tactics, the Germans call it tactic, tactics uh, education, but we could consider today is now operations or operational warfare. And they were one of the only ones. So, and another aspect is there, they forced on looking on combined arms from the very beginning. So they, were, they did all the branches. So all the generals were basically ready for combined arms warfare from the get-go. So they were extreme, officers were extremely, uh, extremely well trained in this regard. And they were famous for this. Another aspect is the Versailles Treaty. Now you would say, wait, what does the Versailles Treaty do? I mean, I covered the Versailles Treaty in one of my visualized videos, but this allowed them, the small army, to, with one, only 100,000 men, this allowed them to focus on the best of the best. So only the best guys got in there. Nobody else, only that they could pick from, from all the, the good guys, they could select the best ones, yeah. And in, in terms of material, for instance, they don't have old material lying around. So they didn't have World War I tanks like the FT-17 that the French still used, for instance, or the old artillery. So they had to build new one, new artillery, new tanks and everything, so they didn't sit around on old material. Then they also gained training with the Soviets, which had a large armored force back then, and they trained with them and gained some experience. And Another aspect is, of course, that Germany was due to, it was undefensible with this army. So there was a constant challenge and threat. For instance, the Saarland crisis, when the French occupied certain parts of Germany. So under this pressure, you work differently. Because they knew, okay, every time they can, some, somebody can basically walk into Germany. And we can't really defend us with our 10 divisions from the Versailles Treaty. So this is, then you work a bit differently and you, you, you could say to a certain degree they were in a semi-war state. And then the whole thinking and everything is different. And also, of course, a bit a little bit revenge and other aspects as well. So there's a complete different mindset than to the, to the other armies. Additionally, then when the Nazis came into power, they gained experience. They gained experience from the Spanish Civil War. They deployed the tank forces there as mentioned in one of my videos, they took their lessons, whereas some of the allies didn't take their lessons, which I also covered in the video. And then there was the, the Anschluss of, of Austria, the occupation of Austria and then the annexation. And you would say, well, there were no shots fired. Well, yes, but the thing is, they entered with their Panzer divisions and other stuff. So they saw, okay, we have breakdowns. We have way too many breakdowns in our, our tanks. We need more maintenance companies. Also, they learned how to do maintenance. Also, they looked, okay, the logistics, we had a problem here. We, we had problems with the fuel or some other stuff. And, and then they, they learned, okay, we adapt. Because you, you, can, you can do peacetime maneuvers all the time. But if you go in a different country, even there's no shots fired, suddenly, oh, the infrastructure is different. Oh, we, what, what happens? We, we don't have the proper maps. You, and you, you learn from this. So you make, let's say you make like 100, 100 arrows while moving your ten Panzer divisions into Austria. Well, probably 50 of those you will never make again because most of your officers experience them or in some other way. The same with, with, the, with the annexation or the end of Czechoslovakia. So there also some experience. They also gained war material, they gained the, the Czech tanks and, and other aspects. So they had far more experience at this point. And then additionally, 
the army and the Luftwaffe worked together far better than anyone else. And this was due to superior doctrine and training. So it was not due to better technology or something, because they trained extensively and put a lot of effort on developing proper doctrine and everything. And here's also the interesting aspect. After the Wehrmacht defeated Poland, in just a matter of weeks, which was a tremendous victory compared, if you look what happened to smaller countries in the First World War, it took months usually to defeat them. And then, and then the, the high command was, we are not satisfied with your performance. They said, okay, we looked at the performance and said, we are not satisfied with what the division said. There's major problems both with the regular and with the reserve units. And we need to change this, 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 and that. So they had a major victory. And then they say, okay, that's not good enough. This was, this was lacking, this was lacking, this was lacking. This is also something I covered with, with the German or Aust also Austrian mentality that we are focusing usually more on the negative aspects and tell people all the time, okay, this was not up to scratch. Whereas other cultures, for instance, focus more on a positive reinforcement. So, you know, the only ones give a whip, the other only get the carrot. Usually is a good combination of both. Now, of course, this always comes at a price. And if you look after the First World War, for instance, the United States and also Britain and to a certain degree also France, they, in their academies, actually focused more on, they had special courses and aspects on economics and grand strategy. This also happened to a certain degree in Germany, but only for a very small amount of time and very limited courses. So the, so the bigger picture was not there. The Germans primarily focused war is operational warfare. This is primarily military, no industrial aspects. Keep away from this. This was not completely this way. So the lessons from the first world war was actually that the Germans noted, okay, in terms of mobilization, the United States is our role model. And they, they looked over there and said, okay, what can we learn from them? But, but if you look at the monographs on what was published, the Germans pu published a book of their, basically their, their experiences of the First World War and how to put it in doctrine in the, with the Heeresdienstvorschrift 487, Die Führung und Gefecht der verbundenen Waffen, Command and Combat of Combined Arms. Yet there was no such book for the economic aspects of the First World War, what they learned. And in the Reichswehr, which was the predecessor of the, of the Wehrmacht, there was always this, there was this struggle between the logistics guys and the operations guys. And, and the operations guys usually told or had this, this attitude, you don't concern yourself with matters that don't have to concern you. Keep, keep out of this. this. This politics, this is economy. Stay away. This is not what an officer should be concerned about. So there were this, this, you could say this, this focus technicians, okay, we do war and war is done with soldiers and with weapons, but economy, no. Economy, politics, no, no. We don't want to have to end with this. So there were several in these aspects. I mean, one of the most famous generals was General Georg Thomas. And, and he actually was quite critical of the major expansion of the Wehrmacht after the Nazis took over and he criticized it as without plan, plan laws, and he wrote several memorandums and everything. And to a certain degree, there was some influence, they, they changed it, but in general, he was never established. One author called him the most unsuccessful German general in the Second World War. And basically, these, these economic guys, let's call them that, they had not enough personnel and to a certain degree, they were basically bullied, you could say. So the primacy in Germany was still war is conducted on a military level. And another aspect was the primacy of offensive and mobility. Now you will probably ask why this primacy on offensive warfare? Why this primacy on conducting war only on a military scale or the mainly military scale? And this goes a long way. This goes basically back to Prussia in the 30 years war. Back then Prussia was rather weak and it was rolled over by many of the different factions. And the father of Frederick the Great, Friedrich Wilhelm I, and also Frederick the Great, they focused on, 
and fighting a war rather fast. So the, basically the focus, um, the, the war should be short and live lively. And this was also due to the fact because Prussia was seen as this power in the middle. It was surrounded by enemies, so the Macht in der Mitte. And I mean, for, for an Austrian to a certain degree, this is quite fun, but I'm not so good in geography, so maybe that's true. But yeah, so they always saw themselves in the middle of France and Russia, for instance, and always surrounded by enemies. And also Austria, to a certain degree, was an enemy at certain points. So they noticed, okay, we, we, can't, we can't win a long war. So we need to focus on short war. Now, there was always this focus on operational speed, on flanking the enemy, encircling him and beating him in a decisive battle. This, basically, there was an obsession with short war. Basically, every warring faction focuses on keeping a war short, but as Centino notes, the Germans or Prussians took it to another level. And this is also very interesting, this aspect, when, when you talk about the machine gun before the First World War, because many people note like, Okay, they missed this chance to introduce it early on, and a very interesting aspect which Markus Pullman brought up, the, the Germans were so focused on offensive warfare, and before the First World War, the machine gun was mainly used, and it could only be used in a defensive way because it was so big. So for, for, but this was not in their mind, because this was for pos positional warfare, and they were always focused on mobile warfare. So for them, machine gun was so basically, yeah, that's nice, but what should we do with that? We want to attack, we want to attack, we want to attack. So they were completely offensively minded. Now, of course, the lessons of the First World War clearly showed that the economy was a major, had a major impact. In the end, the, the, the amount of troops and the amount of material that was brought to the battle, a large amount of tanks from the British, for instance, the Germans had nothing to compare here, and the large amount of troops also with the United States, everything. They, they couldn't compete with that, but to a certain degree, they also still believed that they were not beaten in the field. So they were still beat, not beaten in, on the battlefield. And then only superior numbers brought them down. And, and if you look, the, the Germans in, in early 1918 made several breakthroughs due to Stoßtrupp tactic and advancing the tactical level and on the other aspects. So they actually, and the Stoßtrupp tactic is the basis for modern infantry combat. So on, in this case, this is not, this is to a certain degree, it's, it's an illusion, but not one that is completely out of the world. Another aspect is you could always say, you should focus more on economics. And the question is, would have this been successful? Because Germany is rather locked in. They are very limited in resources. You can focus on economics very well if you're the United States, because if somebody wants to attack you, I mean, leaving aside Canada and, and Mexico, they have to cross one big ocean and also they have all the resources they need in, in their country, whereas Germany is very limited. They have coal, they have iron, they have some other aspects, but they're lacking rubber, they're lacking oil and many other very important materials. So there was this constant lack of resources, which is similar to the Japanese. And if you look what both the Germans and the Japanese did initially in the, in the Second World War was to grab as much, much resources as possible. And then the idea was to hold on to them and then build up these larger economies or these larger armies and everything else so that they have the material. So one could argue, okay, you, you should have trained all your men in grand strategy and, and in economics. The question is if it would have make, made a difference. So thus, they focused mainly on operational warfare and on the military aspects. And in this aspect, they were rather well trained. And this is why the Wehrmacht was till the end basically feared on the battlefield, because the officers and everything, they were focused on fighting on the tactical and operational level, where they were most feared. Now, I hope you have now a better understanding why the Wehrmacht is a combat effective and also why it put the emphasis so much on military warfare. And also that there's a long duration, a long background for this whole thinking, so that there's a lot of going on throughout history with Prussia and everything else. So now thank you here to Torbay for asking this question. Also a big thank you to Jack and Andrew for sending me books that I could use in this video. And also a big thank you to all my Patreons.
Thank you for watching and see you next time.